Geology. 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 This is the mini geology radio program, weekly program about geology and the connections with society. Welcome to Mini Geology at KPFT HD2 channel in the heart of Houston, Texas. Welcome to everybody. Today we're going to talk about the relationship between oil and gas industry, the upstream part of it, and the markets and the geosciences. So the oil and gas industry is considered, as you know, the biggest sector in the world in terms of dollar value. A global powerhouse employing hundreds of thousands of us workers, as well as generating hundreds of billions of dollars globally each year. So the connection with society here is pretty direct. And the investments are considered extremely risky. So in here we have uh, two representatives of the company IHS Market. And the role of IHS Market is to help energy corporations to make well-informed decisions. So we have here today Bob and uh, Karim. Karima and Bob. Bob Frickman was here before with us. Welcome to the show. Thank you, Daniel. It's a pleasure to be back. So, Bob, you're Vice President and Chief Strategist for the Upstream Energy Group at IHS Market. And uh, you follow closely one of these three sectors in which we like to subdivide the oil and gas industry. The Upstream is the one that you follow. We call it also the Exploration and Production. And... Um, consisting the search for the buried energy sources. Uh, the other two, we're going to mention them, but we're not going to talk about them, are the midstream, which uh, engage with the transportation and the storage of the hydrocarbons that we found in the first sector. And the third sector is the downstream, so refining the hydrocarbon and selling them. Uh, Bob, can you tell us uh, what are the fundamentals of the oil and gas business in, in upstream? Yeah, and up, upstream, it's fun. It's, it starts from the ground. So first, picking a picture of the image of the earth and trying to understand what, where those particular hydrocarbons, whether they're oil or gas or a combination, might be. What potentially could be the rocks that, that generate them, as well as the rocks that are the reservoirs. And we look at that part of the equation, and then we move all the way up to the wellhead portion. So then looking for it, finding it, and then helping to get it up to the surface, so to speak, so that it can be marketed and moved forward uh, into products that we use every day in our lives. Karima, what is uh, your role in the, this uh, big uh, company that is IHS Market that is not only about upstream but many other things? Oh, it, it is not. It is spanning the entire energy value chain, so not just oil and gas, renewables. I mean, if it's energy, you, if you can produce it and, and burn it or use it to generate some sort of, of power, then we cover it. So what I do really is I, I work in the upstream team, and I cover basins and companies, essentially looking at um, what the value proposition is for various companies, um, where they should go next, and, and what risks and what factors they need to consider when evaluating, okay, should we go into Africa versus Asia? Um, everything that they would need to know, both from the below the ground, a subsurface point of view. I mean, as a geologist, obviously, um, you have to have some geology in there. So you're a geologist? Just Karima? Yes, I am. Okay. What is your background? Uh, well, background is in uh, geology and petroleum engineering. I, I'm one of those uh, weird hybrids who, who have done both. How do you feel in the IHS? Uh, it's a great company. I mean, uh, what I do now really does encompass both, uh, you know, both disciplines as well as some finance. Because when evaluating basins, I mean, you have to ultimately think about the financial aspect of it, right? I mean, especially now more than ever, I think. Um, investors definitely want to understand where the industry is going, and, and we want to help them do that as well, in addition to other oil and gas companies. Uh, Bob, what are the main differences in the fundamentals that you just talked about between the United States and the rest of the world? Well, when, when we look at the rest of the world, I mean, the rocks, of course, are different everywhere. Every basin is, has a different history, uh, both 
from a geological standpoint, but also from an exploration standpoint. And some of those periods are driven by commercial decisions. Some of those periods are driven by policies, by governments. And outside of the United States, in most cases, the um, mineral resources of which we harvest are owned by the governments and not by the people. So in the United States, we're very unique in that individuals uh, do own mineral rights, and so they have a choice uh, on what happens then to those minerals, and they have a chance then to also share in the benefit of those minerals. So that's a very unique thing when you compare the U.S. to the rest of the world. Including Canada, even if Canada doesn't have this kind of uh, mineral rights. Absolutely, including Canada as well. Um, and there are different ways. So one of the things that we do in our uh, shop is we kind of look at the different regimes, or we call the legislation and regulations around um, extraction of hydrocarbons and other minerals, to be honest, um, and what's the fair trade-off, right? There's a risk-reward for the people of, of trying to get as much um, value and as much value is defined as monetary, but also use-wise, out of those resources that they have. Many governments, that goes into a national treasury and is distributed nationally. Uh, others, um, it's, it's kind of sent around into the different states and provinces. The United States has some sharing, so the federal lands, we have federal lands, mostly offshore, but we do have some onshore. Um, those, the companies pay a royalty just like they do for the individual owners, and that money then gets, goes back to the U.S. government. Um, it is used by the government, but also there's some redistribution to the states, of course, for their benefit. You follow the uh, upstream, which we describe as one-third of the oil and gas um, sectors. Um, who's competing with the oil and gas industry? So stepping back and looking, for instance, at the renewables, uh, uh, or the alternative energies. Uh, uh, who are the competitors with the oil and gas industry? Yeah, abs- absolutely. I mean, it's it's energy, right? And and you've seen many companies rebranding themselves uh, as energy companies. Um, not totally new. I mean, we've most of the uh, traditional uh, oil and gas companies have been involved in renewables for many decades. Uh, but there's a, a major resurgence, new technology, the cost competitiveness now of wind and solar, which are the two leading ones outside of hydro. We have to, often we forget that hydro is a renewable resource. Um, Places like Argentina, Brazil, Peru, um, that dominant energy source for them for power um, is hydro. So as we go forward, you know, we're in this transition. Transitions don't happen overnight. They take decades, maybe one even a century. Most in the energy business, the fuels that we've had in the past have still been with us even in the new era. Coal was really an era of the past. It's still with us. It's still one of the dominant fuels for power, and in some countries it is the dominant fuel. But as we move forward, hydrocarbons um, are needed, right? That's what we run our cars on, our trucks. But more importantly, what we forget is that downstream component that almost everything that we wear, every car that we drive, every plane that we get on, is made from a derivative of hydrocarbons. Those, those carbon molecules make wings for airplanes. They make most of the bumpers and everything in cars. So it's, a, it's going to be with us for quite some decades. Within this transition, there are industries that they are going to... Uh, uh, that they are going to disappear or the oil and gas industry is changing its skin? So, yeah, you're spot on it. So there's a massive transition in the way the companies are approaching things. So there's a group of generally the larger companies in the world who are kind of transitioning to a not just total fossil fuel business model. They're into solar and they're into wind as part of their portfolio. So they're delivering energy. There are other companies, generally independents, um, more specialized companies, who are saying, look, our business, our expertise, whether it's the geoscience, the engineers, the commercial 
folks, et cetera, up and down the line, their specialty is still in extraction and development and production of hydrocarbons. So those folks are, they're still very much attuned to the other big, um, shall we say, overlapping thing these days, which is decarbonization, but they're choosing not to get into the, the selling of wind or solar. They are utilizing wind and solar um, in, their, in their kind of way forward. Most of the, if you look in many of the fields uh, onshore in the world now, they're using solar uh, paneled power uh, in order to transmit the information back to central locations. They're using uh, solar for lights, um, you know, and a lot of different things. It's, so it's, it's, it's a bit of a hybrid, but in a different way. You, you said uh, the carbonization. Uh, so, uh, again, another maybe philosophical question or existential for the oil and gas industry. What's the future of the hydrocarbon exploration in a world that is moving towards an energy transition because it's been accepted that we need to lower the carbon footprint? What is this future? Because we have very uh, emphatic decisions like when New Zealand a few months ago uh, uh, told to the world that they are not going to release any more new exploration leases. Right, so there, there, that's a policy decision. So there are a number of countries that have made policy decisions, whether it's Germany, uh, California, even in the states that are saying, look, we're, we are going to track towards a fossil fuel energy um, reduction of a, an X amount of percentage. And in some cases, they're saying we're going to have zero fossil fuels in our mix. Um, and, and that's a political choice that people can make. But as I said, you're, we're, we still have it ingrained in society, and it won't. It's not going to go away. So, what's happening then is that we're seeing a uh, a compression of potential consumers of the product that exploration is keen on. We've also seen at the same time um, the entire business models change of companies, not so much because of decarbonization. That's helped but really around the profitability and the ability to deal with the new um, landscape. And that new landscape is really one of volatility. It's volatility of price. If you think of oil and gas prices go up and down, gas goes up and down as heat and cold, right? We see it fluctuate very much depending on that. The price could go any, it could be a three to five dollar fluctuation on gas. Or, or, or less, um, you also see a, a massive change in the volatility of the markets. So the, the people that are buying things are changing, right? China and Asia are now becoming the largest consumers. It used to be the U.S. You're seeing c countries like the, in the Middle East, like Saudi and Kuwait and UAE becoming massive gas consumers. So you're seeing markets changing. You're also seeing at the same time a big change when you think about geopolitics, whether it's Venezuela, Nigeria, Libya. So we're in this world now that's very volatile. And in order to be successful then, you have to be flexible, you have to ha be agile, and your speed of decision making is changing. So that takes a different beast. It takes, that's why we've seen so many people move to what we call the short cycle or flexible barrels, like in the U.S. Those are ones that we can adjust the capital spending up and down then for these cycles. And that's what makes the U.S. so attractive or other areas onshore, West Siberia, the Middle East, so they can ramp that rig up and down very easily as they get a signal to drill or a signal to produce. Um, they can change things as very, in, a, in a time window that's less than a year, whereas the old new venture world, the average time to first oil was running seven years, nine years in Brazil, uh, best in class is three years. But this... Uh, Themes that you are touching on right now, including volatility, they 
are uh, short term and, and very rapid cyclics that they oscillate uh, rapidly. But what about the, yes, the existential uh, issue of the hydrocarbon industry when uh, the society, it seems, that has decided to move slowly but uh, directionally away from it? Well, I mean, as I said, it's, it's not going away, right? We still have to use the cars, we beat the rubber, we have to do all these different things that we are so used to, the buttons, the zippers, everything that we wear has plastics in it. Um, you're right in that the sense that the a number of consumers and the amount they consume may shrink. Um, and so there is this competitive nature that's gotten, and so there's a, uh, I guess, a belief or a strategy within the business right now that uh, it's best to be the lowest cost producer. And that's why we see folks um, often in their at public announcements for companies saying, you know, my portfolio is the lowest cost in this basin, or my portfolio is stress tested to forty dollars or thirty dollars. So we're seeing that. So there is a, a feeling or a belief that, you know, potentially some hydrocarbons could be left in the ground um, because we do have an overabundance for the call that we need right now. And so there is that sense that going forward. 20 years from now or 15 years from now, there will be um, fewer buyers of that product and therefore if you want to be the attractive one, um, basically from a commercial standpoint, you've got to have the right crude quality or gas and you've got to be you know, the most attractive on a price basis. So you have to offer the product at a low price, right. low cost. I yeah, and that's what, you know, Karim has been working on some of those kinds of projects. So tell us, Karim, about it. Yeah, I, I think, I mean, I just want to echo some of, of what Bob did say. I mean, hydrocarbons are not going away anytime soon. What we're seeing, perhaps, is that the emergence of, of renewable or, or clean energy really is just, it's sort of, if you look at an industry life cycle curve, we're just probably more at the beginning of it, whereas oil and gas industry is obviously, it, it's been through many different growth cycles and so what you have is is a balance really of multiple energy sources and what operators need to think about is how they balance their portfolio as, as Bob alluded to and it's it's very much like how you would balance your personal stock portfolio right as a company you need to think about what levels of risk you want to take whether it's like you said alluding to this sort of you know existential crisis where people have to reconcile in their minds that yes, we still do need hydrocarbons, but we may not need as much, um, and and we just use them in different ways um, and repurpose them, because ultimately things like electric vehicles they're not entirely without sin either, right? I mean, sourcing minerals from very con conflict areas of the world. I mean, that's the, you know to make your batteries for for your cars. That's not without sin either. So I think what people have to reconcile in their mind is that, you know, one is not necessarily better than the other. You just find different purposes for for different things, right? And, and the electricity comes from where, right? So yeah, exactly. And so it, it's not going away anytime soon. But um, the whole short cycle type development, I, I guess, it's not really limited to. Uh, the onshore U.S. as you're alluding to, it's it really is. It's not so much a resource type as it is a, a resource strategy. So it's about cycle time compression. I mean, if you you have development that used to take maybe 10 years, um, you know, from the time you drill a well and, and find something to actual production, now you have compression of that cycle time because of, well, three main things. So you've got one, people are just wiser with their money, so they're not necessarily investing in the 20-year the cycle projects anymore. Uh, two, you've got technology, which is advancing things um, at entirely an accelerated rate. And three, you have people who are returning to uh, basins globally that maybe were not explored to their full potential. And so these three things, really, what they you know, have in, in common is that they lend to cycle time compression, which is is what we're all after for the oil and gas world. So, 
cycle time compression karima tell me what do you read being a geologist uh, in order to know these things what do you study really i i worked in finance oh, <laughs> okay as well so working with investment bankers um they want their money and they want it quickly so uh, it's, uh, yeah so in which respect amazing. being a geologist help uh, with this kind of uh, financial topics so it, it helps because i mean I, i've worked as a geologist for marathon oil and for conical phillips and uh, you know that experience is essentially has taught me that you know as, as a scientist you obviously need to identify your subsurface properties you need to look at your well logs you need to look at your seismic um, but ultimately you have to have some sort of business development cap on top of that right so what I worked in was petrophysics mostly and so looking at things on sometimes a nano Darcy scale um, which to me was really cool because you have the ability to identify reservoir now that perhaps was not really thought of as prolific before like by the time I got into industry uh, well logging technology had changed quite a bit from from back in the day and so um, that sort of technological advancement um, seeing how that is sort of propagated for the past 10 years and how that has grown um, it, it essentially has taken geoscience I feel to a new frontier almost um, but one thing that I always do keep in the back of my head is, okay, this is really cool, this is amazing rock, but can it make money? I see, interesting, because uh, sometimes I wonder, right, because um, the upstream, uh, uh, the, the, the real workers are the, the earth scientists, the geologists, the explorers, the engineers, uh, but then uh, the <laughs> managers, they are, mostly they are not and it seems they don't need to be uh, they don't need to have that kind of uh, of knowledge necessarily uh, so that depends on what manager is talking about right yes some of, some of us <laughs> spent years finding oil and gas before we moved up right it's like any other profession but it's difficult to it's not be univocal they it's not is unidirectional right the other professions uh, the the our colleagues that they study finance uh, they don't go back uh, and to study geology it's occasionally but there there are not so many uh, I, mean, I could think of a uh, there are more and more of the banks have uh, geoscientists that are helping with their analysis of companies because particularly with the um, tight rocks and the unconventionals um, it, they're much more complicated. It's much more detailed technical information that you have to understand to kind of really understand the company. I mean, they're they're throwing out type curves. They're throwing out things about how many feet per lateral, how many barrels per lateral foot of production, and then they're showing you um, detailed logs and things that are, where they're doing petrophysics to kind of tell their story. And so it does take a little more technical background uh, to try to understand and, and put those two things together. I think, though, that one thing that in some ways maybe you're right is that for new ventures, so we've kind of really had a, a change, right? We've New ventures, exploration, it, it, that's the kind of thing that conjures up the, the guy going to the North Pole for the first time or the, the lady who's lost in the jungle with that, you know, looking around for some mythical rocks or some high place where there might be hydrocarbons that you know conjures up dreams and I, I and did some... have one of those experiences so working in the oil sands up in Athabasca in Canada you walk along the Christina River and you see oil seeps so what was supposed to be a hike actually did turn out to me wandering and finding oil seeps yeah it's that it's your own individual exploration right it's like just like every time you go on vacation and you see if it's someplace new you, you see for the first time, wow, I, I went to Argentina and I went to Torre de Pines and I said, what in the world is that sticking up, right? Um, it's your own exploration of well. So there's that uh, in unique kind of identity that we kind of associate with new ventures. Um, and oftentimes the people that are the good oil finders are the very creative ones, a little bit different maybe in their... Um, the way they think and the way that they act and things, but they're creative kinds of folks, right? They might be the ones that in, in a different life might have been uh, some kind of an artist or something, right? And 
those folks, um, yeah, in many cases are not necessarily good at management. Um, and and not, you don't probably don't even want some of them in there, right, if their skill is thinking about things and putting these things together. Because that, that's what it's really about is solving puzzles. And all of us every day are solving different kinds of puzzles. But in New Ventures, you're taking surface geological data. You're taking satellite data. You're taking, in some cases, in my days in Latin America, we took journals from the early explorers in the 1500s in Spanish, but not even normal Spanish, classical Spanish or Italian, and tried to see where, exactly what you said, Karima, where did some Indian show him that there or that there was some exactly. kind of funny stuff that they put all over their body to so help them, right? <laughs> um, like or talk like in Trinidad, right? Right. The, the seeps, the vitamin seeps. Exactly. So it's a detective game, and, and or then Mexico. <laughs> you try to lower the risk is what you're trying to do, right? It's the it's a game of managing risk, and whether it's first finding out, yay, yeah, there's some kind of a movable hydrocarbon there. B, is there something that can contain that? And that whole model blew up before we were taught in school that it's either in a sand or it's in a carbonate. Now we know that it can be in a silt, it can be in a shale, it's almost in everything. And the real problem is, what are those rocks that are down there can you extract it from economically? Then you have to figure out, okay, with this volume of, of oil or gas, how do you think then about the trap, right? How big is it? What does it look like? Is it big as the city of Houston, or is it the size of the pool in my backyard? Um, and those are the kind of key things that we're trying to put together. And we have to think about, okay, well, if, if that oil or gas um, was generated, where did it go? Did it get into this tank, or did it get in there and leave? Maybe that's why there's a seat, because it got out of there. So we have we usually use you know four or five of these basic principles that we're trying to solve the puzzle um, on on working that. Some folks um, like Karima, you know, worked to, started off as specializing in petrophysics and looking at the really detailed rocks, right? Super detail. I mean, it's it, honestly it's it's like you say, you know, you start by thinking, okay, your reservoirs, your, your sandstone or your carbonate typically, and now we have the ability, to, I mean, we have NMR logging and, and shale, we have the ability to do nano Darcy type analysis, which, I mean, a couple decades ago wasn't really around, so it's another example really of how far we've come. Um, but, but one thing, I mean, you know, talking about traps and seals and, and what seeps out and isn't there in the ground anymore, um, the Guyana Basin. That's one thing that um, I've been working on for quite a bit, and it's sort of one of those stories and one of those riddles we're trying to piece together ourselves, because it's obviously a basin that's very much in the news. It's very hot. Everybody knows about Exxon's Lisa discovery in Guyana. But one of the things we're trying to solve, really, is, is what's going on under the ground right next door in Suriname. Um, and so that's, you know, that that's something we're trying to solve, but we're also trying to figure out, you know, in, in terms of assessing the whole basin, which is what Bob and I do, as well as my team at IHS, um, is really trying to look at can this basin work from a subsurface point of view, number one, but also number two, is there room for anybody else to get into this basin? I mean, so it's not just a subsurface risk, it's, you know, you as a company, if you're not in this basin, do you want to pay such a premium for this acreage because it's it, it's it's having its 15 minutes of fame right now, right? Do you want to pay that much money for it, get in, and then, uh-oh, this particular area in this basin doesn't work. So so that's that's really what we try to do. We try to tell this story and and make people aware of okay, you know these these are the risk factors and. and I know. want to come back to uh, Suriname and um, and Guyana and especially how you collect the data to say what you say. But before that, I would like to uh, tackle this other uh, problem of the uh, exploration in general. So. Uh, it seems that uh, during these years we are redefining exploration. 
And so I would like you, Bob, to tell us what you think, uh, what is going to be the future of exploration if we are still in the uh, kind of mode of uh, new ventures, as you describe, or if it is something else. Yeah, and it, it, it's a great question. So we, the way that we kind of explain it in our shop really is that we've kind of split into two camps. So there is a camp of new venture explorers still that are willing to, to go into frontier basins. And those are generally a small group because when we look at historically, when we take a 10-year or five-year period, there's only a group of eight to ten companies that consistently discover economic hydrocarbons in, in frontier basins. It's a very small group. So part of the discussion then amongst the boards and management teams was, why are we paying for new venture exploration when we're not really good at it? Right? The results show we're not. So I said, well, what do we do then? But we, we still need to replace barrels because every time we produce a barrel or a molecule of gas, we have to replace that because that's our business model, right? It's a declining uh, asset. So then you start thinking about, so if I'm going to buy down risk, and the risk scale kind of goes frontier, then you kind of have an emerging basin, then you, have a, you, you make some more wells, some more discoveries, then as that kind of matures, you get into that mature phase, you kind of get on a plateau then where you're not making a lot of discoveries um, or they're smaller. And then terminally, it could just end, right, just like a, a field might, right? It could, could finish eventually in 30 or 40 years or 50 years. And some fields, though, or, or basins, um, we reinvent them, just like the Permian. The Permian is one of the greatest examples of reinventing a mature basin. You know, we went from a basin where we had 37 billion barrels equivalent produced to one now that has the overall potential of 122 billion barrels, numbers that were just released by the USGS. And then you have other basins that were like the Santos Basin. In the Santos Basin, we tried for years. In the 70s, there was a risk around in 78. There was one field found in the 80s there, a little gas field. People drilled what they thought the right play type was around some salt domes and some features. And it just sort of, the interest dissipated for decades because nobody had any new ideas. The focus went to the north of the country. It was also closed for activity outside of the National Oil Company. And then again, we had a new idea. But that basin was really kind of in that frontier period. And we came up with a new idea that's propelled it now out of that after decades. Right? So basins have different lives that you need to think about. And that's the important. So when you, when you come back then to the company model that you want to think of, you kind of if you're not really good at frontier exploration and you don't join with those that are... Who are the good ones? Uh, uh, it's uh, probably uh, better that we don't... No, I don't be uh, name say which kind of... Uh, is are small companies, the majors, are national well, oil companies? Or? Yeah, that's a good question. So in, in general, it's a mix, right? Um, the, the, historically, the independents have taken more risk. They're the ones that were willing to kind of go for that, that sort of long lead risk item sort of thing. Um, more recently, we've seen uh, some of the larger majors kind of take over that spot. Um, and so it's, it, it's a kind of a mix. There's a few national oil companies in that, in that pool. Um, and it's mixed around the regions, too. So they're not, but they tend to be um, similar in thought. Many, they're very specialized in where they play. They may play like just the Atlantic basins. Okay. Or they may just, one, sh one shop focuses on carbonates. And very few companies have carbonate t exploration teams. Um, they tend to um, be, as I said, very focused. They're, they also apply um, advanced you know, seismic work. They, they try to do a lot more um, detailed geoscience that goes with it. But 
they're they're quick, really quick at moving too. They're very agile. So in a way, they are similar because they are good uh, explorers. They are winners, but in another sense, they are completely different because each of them they have a, a different subdiscipline or subsector where they explore. Yeah, I mean, there's some overlap with some of them. Some there's a number that are playing deep water, um, but they stay very focused on that. Um, what's been successful for the ones in the deep water and the Atlantic margins is that they've actually gone out, drilled a well, and calibrated the subsurface and gotten a model that works. And so once they have a discovery, they then take that across the margin and expand it and hoping, you know, and, 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 and moving around, whether it's up and down the African side or on the Atlantic side or both sides. So it's better to stay focused. On Absolutely, and that's that's what we're seeing overall. Um, and we can talk about that in a minute. So, uh, on portfolios, and maybe Karima can jump on that one in a second. But the last kind of piece, then, so what do you do? Um, you need to replace those barrels, and you can't get it all from the existing fields, right? So you go into these basins that are either are have stopped in their frontier period at a at an emerging phase. So in other words, they've made some discoveries, but they haven't quite ramped all the way up to that curve. They're still growing. There's still lots of potential, billions potentially left. And so you play in that emerging basin. That gives you a little less risk because you're in a proven. You have all those things proven. Maybe three out of the five things that we usually talk about are proven, uh, or four out of the five. It depends on your company's tolerance. Or you might play right at the cusp between a mature and emerging if that basin is big enough. You know, I mean, we have basins like West Siberia that have hundreds of billions of barrels left. Um, the Zagros, you know, 225 billion barrels equivalent left. And that's a, a basin that's huge, right? Um, so you, people start doing that, and then they think about, well, what is it that we have? What are our skill sets, right, that differentiate us? And that's where they think about, okay, well, we have folks that are really good at at looking at carbonates, or we have some folks that are really good at s looking at these kind of depositional sands that are fluvial or something. So they specialize rather than generalize. Um, and, and so we see a lot more of that going on. Interesting, because I thought that we were going into a trend where they want um, the groups to be more generalists rather than specialists. Well, but I think that in some sense you're right, but what you want, and back to what Karima was talking about, is that you know the geoscientists and the engineers have to be generalists in the whole value chain. So while each of us may be you know, a specialist in stratigraphy, carbonates, um, well completion, geochemistry, basin analysis, etc. Okay. You need that team because you're starting at one point in the complex and moving all the way through. And you, you see that greatly now when you, even in the unconventionals, where they've really understood that a lot of the first part of the unconventionals is, is leading with the petrophysics go, and geochemistry and then moving down the geological continuum for you know production and development, whereas in some other cases, you know maybe you lead with field geology first and move out. So the generalist, yes, you need to understand the, the ultimate goal that Karima said is money. Can I make anything out of this? Right. That, that that's one of I feel like it's come more into our industry now um, compared to I would say about a decade ago. It's like I said, um, you have to always have that BD, uh, you know, can I make money out of this cap on? But one of the things that we're seeing now in industry that's not necessarily geoscience related, but across the entire industry is we're seeing a sort of a, a skill set change. So something that came out of um, Sarah Week, uh, as you know, IHS Market puts on Sarah Week every year. And what came out of Sarah Week last year was that um, something like deep water expertise is something that once you lose it, it's very hard to regain it. 
So what we're seeing is that traditional deep water operators, perhaps when you have the whole crew change, I mean, this happens, you know, obviously every couple couple of decades, um, is that that valuable skill set in something like deep water operations is lost, um, and deep water exploration, actually. So that's one of the things that companies really have to think about um, when planning their portfolios is because while yes if you have the capital and you have the availability and, and the permission to go after those big deep water finds the question you have to ask yourself is do you have the skill set and does industry have the skill set like what are these up-and-coming geoscientists um, planning to be working in what do they want do it do they want to be in the oil and gas industry and so this is one of the crises I feel like in industry we have to address as well and and make people aware that you know it's not just about being a one-dimensional type of, um, you know professional anymore it, it's about having multiple different skill sets um, integrating everything from um, understanding how finance plays into you getting funding for exploration wells to be drilled but also understanding how things like um, analytics and data science can really help you as a geoscientist. I mean, you are a scientist. So so that's one of the things as well I feel like we need to, to really address in industry. And I would like to talk about uh, the data that you were mentioning because you are studying um, several basins around the world. And uh, before uh, talking about the specifics of the basins, I would like to know about how do you collect the data, where? Do you collect the data? So, I mean, we we are a, a research and consulting company. We are primarily known for our data, and um, the approach really is we collect data from multiple different sources. I mean, from industry expert interviews, from the public domain, from um, pretty much any number of sources out there. If it's out there, we will get it. And Even then, if it is not out there, you're going to get well, it. <laughs> <laughs> because otherwise comment. everybody could do that, right? <laughs> that is true. I think we have the advantage in, in that we do have um, industry connections and we permeate industry so much through networking, events, and, and just having that community built up. So so we do you know do scouting trips quite frequently to different companies and so it's we do have that advantage. but. It's not just about having the data. It's about having good quality data, which we do have, but also... Exactly. How do you <laughs> understand that yeah. the data you have is of high quality? Um, or how do you filter or how do you understand that some data is better than other data that you have in your data set? So I would say that it is an important process. You can't just take the data as gospel, right? So the important thing I, I try to do is obviously look for outliers, right? And you try to validate against multiple different sources within the company. Well, tell you, me more again. So what do you yeah. do with outliers? Why do you look for outliers? Uh, because these are the things that either I have to ask Bob Frickland about <laughs> or <laughs> to validate or um, essentially just try to investigate. Like, But do you I like say, them or you don't like the outliers? Uh, it it depends. I mean, from a petrophysical background, obviously outliers, um, either there's something wrong with your well logging tools that you have to recalibrate or, uh, you know, it's any no one number of things. So outliers, I don't really like them. Um, there are some cases where if I really am just finding validation over and over again that this outlier does actually exist, even then I have a hard time accepting it. But data is the data, right? I, th I think the the goal really now is is not so much just having data, it, it's having good quality control over it and generating your own set of smart data, right, from your stock data set. Because you, as an analyst, you know, as a scientist, this is, this is what you are paid for, to use your judgment, your analysis to really generate your own um, smart data set. Okay, before the smart data set, how could it be that sometimes, um, let, talking about data, let's talk about uh, production as uh, an example. Um, you see um, different um, uh, sources of information and the two different sources of information that are telling you that the production of uh, the well uh, X is different. That happens. Why is, why is that? It does happen and I would say it probably comes down to, I mean the times it's happened to me, um, it's been an error of either 
something as simple as the date code being wrong um, of the production curve being shifted slightly it's it's any number of of, uh, of reasons really in each case is is really quite unique um, but production discrepancies especially I would say sometimes it comes down to reporting um, whoever's collected the data and whatever the sources it, it just wasn't reported right I mean I've, I've worked in operations before and you can have any number of things happening uh, either on a well logged truck or on a derrick and so yeah I mean I think some of the one way to think of it is that oftentimes you have to understand what's what's in that number right there was a an interesting piece written in the Wall Street here recently that was talking about that shales the, um, not making money and that all of these type curves are erroneous that they're consistently underproduced but actually um, the folks that write the story didn't really understand that they weren't looking at the whole picture they were looking at only one component of the liquids they were looking at the oil and the condensate poison they were missing the all the NGLs so the massive difference then in what kind of a economic analysis you get and at IHS market we have over 70 years of doing this work and we have the, the largest most complete database in the world the IEA the EIA you know all the OPEC everybody in the world uses our data because of that um, and, and we try to um, do the quality checks but you know some of what Cream is saying is it's a benchmarking. You know, it's looking for those those outliers. Um, we we try to also do it by having experts in those regions and in those particular disciplines looking at everything uh, to kind of verify it. And then uh, folks like Karima and others on our team are using the data themselves, and so they'll they'll you know kind of look for things too when they see stuff and say they'll talk back to the folks who are maybe the researchers in field. So the researchers in reserves or the ones that are doing the wells or seismic or anything and say, okay, you know, I see this, um, help me out here, right? Mm -hmm. um, so we're, it's a constant renewal process, a constant upgrading uh, process. Yeah, um, when we get data from governments or, or public sources, which is, you know, we have to, that's the key thing is you have to be able to um, know the providence of that data, right? Uh, we've had many, many people here recently with companies have gone out of business or they've given back their licenses overseas and stuff and say, um, geez, I don't know what to do with this data. Would you like this? You're in that business. And we say, well, maybe, right? Because if we get a well log or a seismic line and it comes from, you know, some individual, we don't know if they have the right to own that or not, right? especially if it's overseas, most of the time that's government property. Um, and so we have to we have to be very careful because, um, you know, data nowadays is extremely important, but the IP, the intellectual property, is is critical. Um, and, and then we have, um, uh, so we, we're split into teams. So we have regional teams that kind of look at everything from when that well is permitted all the way out to its, its abandonment and they they're specialists in well logs and looking at well locations contracts so we have every contract that was ever done o over the years in the world um, who owns it what they're you know kind of all the details around it uh, then we have a group that looks at all the fields we have an exploration kind of um, analyst who looks at what's going on with prospects you know so we have maps of all the prospects in the world and that's I mean, in the data. You name it, we've got it. We've got well test data, petrophysical data. I mean, the, the team that I work on essentially, I'm I'm an internal client of of this data, and so using it to generate, uh, you know, our upstream insights really is is what does help with the the creation of that smart data that I talked about as well, and that continuous refinement um, process that Bob just went through as well. So, so Karima, going back to your uh, smart data set that you create. Uh, through this uh, quality control and uh, after listening to Bob and his new um, redefinition of exploration wh which do you think according to your experience are uh, exciting basins where to go nowadays exciting basins I mean uh, 
you know, it, it, there, there's really, there's any number of basins. So there's the Guyana Suriname Basin, which I, I did go into talking a little bit about, um, which, like I said, is, is going through its moment of fame right now. But there's also basins in Mexico, um, the Sureste Basin. I mean, Mexico is accessible now because of the energy reform. And, um, you know, these are places that are really highly underexplored um, for, for any number of, of political and above ground reasons. And so Mexico has a lot to offer for that I think uh, it's anywhere from the emerging spectrum of things, meaning that there has been development in this basin, but there's a lot of potential left. Um, but also there's frontier areas in Mexico. If you want to be one of those companies who are good at frontier exploration, you've got um, areas there to go. Um, you've got Alaska as well to go to. Um, that's another basin that's seeing a, a rejuvenation um, in a very different way that the Permian is seeing a rejuvenation, but it's essentially the same concept. Like, it, it's a strategy, right? Um, it's not necessarily the type of rock. Um, you can rejuvenate any basin. So tell us what are two different strategies to rejuvenate um, a basin? Well, so one, you can either, one, look at different stratigraphic uh, levels that you haven't really examined before, either due to technology limitations or depth limitations. Um, you can essentially reprocess all your seismic, recalibrate your geo models, um, obviously due to the advanced um, data manipulation capabilities we have now that can help you identify um, new prospects to target as well. And there's also rejuvenation from the, the purely exploitation point of view, which is applying new hard technology. So, so whether it's through fracking and horizontals or extended reach wells, um, you know, so, so really you've got this sort of twofold aspect to rejuvenation, one from the soft technology side, which is the data side, which can help you identify overlooked uh, formations or plays, and two from the hard technology side, which is really, um, you know, your exploitation technology, like uh, your drilling and completions technology, your actual equipment, uh, for example. So, so these are really the, the two key ways that you can rejuvenate a basin. Uh, Bob, what about you? Do you have a favorite uh, basin? And uh, if you exclude the so-called non-technical risks, uh, uh, just about geology, which would be the one that you would choose? Well, if it's only one, that's a difficult question. If I get more than one, I could Of course. You, you can mention it, uh, the ones that but, you like. But, you know, for me, um, I still, ha still have some uh, fondness for some of the super basins, really, that uh, the ones that have produced more than five billion and have a multiple of that still left um, and, and I, th I like the new Ken Basin a lot in Argentina I think that has a lot more to give it's not just about the Vaca Muerta that we hear so much about um, I think when you go overseas um, it's I, I still am fascinated very much by some of the old giants like Western Siberia uh, there's a lot left in that particular basin uh, and, and we've seen that's the, they've drilled the second most horizontal wells in the world over there, uh, which kind of is below everybody's radar. But that's a very interesting place um, to go and and still find more. Um, it's easy to hook up fast. Uh, it's helped Russia in many ways. You know, as they're uh, fighting back and forth between the three of us, you know, the U.S., Russia, and Saudi, of who's the uh, largest producer in the world. Um, it's one that's definitely helped them um, get into the mark uh, from that standpoint. Um, so in the in the proven basin world, those are a couple of ones that I, I have a strong interest in. If you want to think about ones that are more new ventures, I think we kind of think of this as the year of, of Southern Africa. Um, there's a lot of new venture frontier basins uh, that are kind of on the docket to be drilled. Uh, there's a well going down right now in the Otaniqua Basin. Uh, I think that would be a good challenge to see if anybody can spell that. Um, it could be that my pronunciation is wrong, but anyway, uh, Total is, Africa, and, yeah. and partners are drilling a well right now there. Um, you also will have some wells here shortly just up the coast towards uh, Mozambique in there and uh, in, in an area just off of uh, Durban in what's called an Atoll Trough. Um, and then if you come around the Horn, the other side, the uh, Orange River Basin, another one that we've 
uh, had a discovery up that way for decades. Nobody's ever been able to offset it. But um, so it's kind of the year of of uh, Southern Africa, if you would, from that standpoint. Um, that, that's kind of an interesting thing to watch uh, as we're going forward. Uh, Bob, what about now in the very last minute? W w what messages do you have for geoscientists that they are uh, studying or maybe uh, looking for a job? Um, from your point of view, what would you suggest them to specialize in or what does IHS need uh, needs from them? Yeah, I think the, it's a great question. So things have changed a little. Um, the, what we are looking for um, in our shop and in many of the companies, I think, and it behooved the the masters and and uh, the bachelors and and PhD students um, overall really to is to hone your skills on um, data analytics, uh, things like Python. Um, whether your in a visualization is either going to be in Power BI, um, Spotfire, or Tableau, um, that's what's helping us also in the QC world because then we can throw stuff up really quick and look at it and find those outliers uh, that Kareem is talking about. So that's a, that's a critical skill um, that we're after. We're also after folks that really want to be part of a team, too, um, and that do bring some diversity, but at the same, you know, of, of thought, but also are, um, want to be part of that team, but are um, afraid, not afraid to, to um, challenge the status quo I tell my folks, um, and Karima doesn't work for me, but she still gets my story, which is, you know, if I ever tell you that that's the way we always did it, then she needs to um, tell me to put a dollar in the bucket because... Only uh, one? <laughs> well, I'll go <laughs> broke, no. perhaps, maybe, but... but. No, it's a, it be, yeah, be, be adaptable, be flexible, um, don't be afraid uh, to just speak up and, and speak your mind and, and be a critical thinker. And to allude to, you know, to Bob's point, natural language processing, any kind of, you know, analytical skills you can pick up, that will help you immensely. All right. Well, uh, that is useful also for the chairs of the departments of um, geologic departments that they are thinking about um, the future of their students. Very important. I hope you listeners that you enjoy. Today, the chat that we have with uh, Bob and uh, Karima. And Karima, do you want to say your last name? Mohammed. Karima Mohammed. Karima Mohammed and Bob. See, that's Franklin. an easy one. <laughs> yeah. It's harder. The first name's harder. <laughs> and Bob Franklin.